Um, first of all, I, uh, I want to welcome everybody who is listening in and to our, our fellow panelists. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining this panel on what we call the new Tech Touch Balance. Uh, my name is Matt Shar. I am a senior director at Axiom Venture Lab. We are an early stage venture fund whose aim is to support the world's most innovative fintech startups and founders in their efforts to create a more financially inclusive world. Uh, today, I'm really excited to be joined by three founders in the Venture Lab portfolio. Um, Louis Borchardt from Henry, Michael Moreland from Field Intelligence, and Eli Pollack from Apollo Agriculture. Um, and in a moment, I'll have a question to each of you to uh, kick off the conversation and give you a chance to introduce yourselves. Um, but first of all, uh, welcome to all of our panelists, and uh, it's great to see you all again here on video. Now, for our audience, I also want to just encourage you to uh, to use the chat to ask questions. We do have some folks from the Axion side who will be able to moderate and uh, and share some of those questions. Uh, we'll spend about twenty five minutes uh, with some with some questions for our panelists, and then we'll open it up for the uh, for the rest of the audience to ask anything that is on your mind. Um, and also, I would encourage the three of you uh, here up on stage to ask questions of one another as well. Um, while I've, I've peppered it with questions, I'm sure you also have some insightful ones to share with each other. So I uh, fully encourage that. Um, let's uh, go and get into the topic, though. Uh, as mentioned, this is we're talking about the tech touch balance today. And uh, really, this is an important one in the field of financial inclusion, um, particularly in a world with continue, continued expansion of what we call a, a digitally native set of connection points with customers. A few areas of, of critical exploration need to come to mind. Um, first, it's where does the in-person relationship in that, uh, in that tech come into play? And does being digitally native actually run the risk of being exclusionary? And how do we adopt the right balance to support the historically underserved in their journey toward financial inclusion. Um, I also think it's really necessary for us to talk about this in the shadow of the ongoing pandemic, because that really has also affected the shift in a variety of ways. And we're seeing more uh, digitally adoptive countries rebound from the pandemic at a faster pace um, than their counterparts. So with that in mind, I, I wanted to start uh, on a question to uh, you, Luz. I'd um, love to hear more about uh, what you're building at Henry. Um, and also as a follow-up, as you've grown as a company, um, how has the usage of technology with your with your customers evolved vis-a-vis uh, -vis in person communication and engagement? Okay, thank you for, for being here. Like thank you. Hi everybody. Um it's an honor for me to be here at this panel. Um so my name is Luz Borchardt. Um, I'm co-founder of Henry. Henry is a computer science school which trains software engineers with zero upfront cost in exchange for a portion of their future income, also known as the ISA, Income Sharing Agreement. We founded Henry um, to challenge the status quo of education in LATAM by giving access to anyone who's willing to participate in its intense curriculum. Um, with this, uh, we're looking to untap talent, no matter economic or social background, and thereby investing in underrepresented human potential. And our zero model cost provides opportunity for people to land in, in high paying jobs that are which pay on average 4x more. And this represents a life changing opportunity for a region which has the highest like world's in a, income inequality rates now as Latin America. And here we're, we're trying to solve like two big challenges. Um, Henry's roles in providing affordable financing for high quality technical education can help address multi-faceted challenges in Latin America, such as like income inequality, as I was saying, high unemployment, and this uh, skills gap or the, the skill worker shortage, um, like facing both, both students and employers in Latin America, right? So um, to give you uh, a context, just in 2020, um, the skills gap, we had like more than 1 million tech job openings in Latin America, but less than 100K professionals with the skills and the training necessary to fill these roles. No doubt that COVID has, uh, has accelerated all these numbers and we are expecting for 2025 to have 149 million jobs uh, open in technology in, in, in the world and 25 um, million in Latin America. So there's a huge uh, skills gap, but we always say that um, Henry Models does not only speaks to, to the skill gap of like providing high quality education, 
<clears throat> but also closing the inequality gap, right? Giving this uh, access to everybody uh, who is willing to to participate and who wants to land in 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 jobs which are rewriting the future in technology. Um, Latin America, uh, it's one of, of of the regions which has eight of the ten most unequal countries in the world. Only fourteen percent of the population has access to higher education. And uh, employment employment rate has has raised uh, in uh, in through co through COVID um, to to a twelve percent. Um, so we always say that education is the best way to solve the world um, inequality, but only if it's accessible for everyone and high quality. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about Henry. Great. Um, thanks, Liz. And I, I'm curious as a, as a follow up, the um, given the fact that many of your your students are, are coming from different sorts of backgrounds in which their engagement with technology has varied. They want to move into a technology professional role. Um, how have you how have you seen the way of balancing out um, their their awareness of technology and, and sort of how they ramp up to that versus others of your students who might be a little more savvy in technology when they get started in the curriculum? Yeah, well, that is a challenge we, we are also working right now, um, which is kind of educating the people about um, moving into technology in Latin America. You have countries which are all, like really um, conservative and traditional and which all which relay on, on super traditional education methods, such as uh, in-person education, like this myth of um, delivering a, an online education is not the same or like, the lots of barriers that we have to, to break also um, regarding this aspect. For example, there are lots of companies who ask you for a certification or for, for like kind of a degree, an university degree, and we're trying to kind of um, um, work upon those, you know, barriers. And it's super difficult for this like population to kind of un to understand, like, why should I study technology, right? Like, why is technology a good opportunity for me? Like, uh, so we're doing a lot of education around those topics in order to not only attract the super like tech SAV base, um, but also the people who don't, are not too aware about it, education. And in that, uh, having said the, having said this, um, our our back like our students profile is super diverse. We have people from all over Latin America, from uh, different uh, social classes. Um, we 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 want like the we we want the the class to be super um, diverse and which represent a lot of you know culture and different backgrounds and by that we're we're trying to kind of of deliver uh, an experience which you know blends the the human interaction like with giving lots of um, live and online lectures but also in a super you know fast way and in four months in order to get employed. So the way we are doing to attract these people, um, which are maybe not too tech savvy, is to kind of show examples or stories of other Henrys, which which already, you know, go went from the program and are working for companies in the US and all over Latin America. And their own example, you know, their their own example of of moving into technology, of making a career shift was the the way to kind of illuminating these people in order to to come um and and to be on board in Henry. Great. No, that's, that's, that's a really helpful context. Thanks, Luz. Uh, Michael, I'll turn the, the same question to you if you'd share a little more about field and, uh, and also maybe sharing a bit more about the context of um, your customer base, which is quite, quite a different one compared to, um, I think, to, to Luz and Eli's. Um, so great to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, sure. Thank you again, Matt uh, and, uh, and SoCap. Uh, again, Michael Moreland, CEO and uh, co-founder of Field. And uh, we work in healthcare supply chain in Africa. Uh, globally, there are uh, uh, every year about 10 million people around the world that die from uh, diseases that are otherwise treatable by safe and affordable medicines. They just don't have access. Uh, this is particularly true in Africa. Uh, the countries where we work right now in Nigeria and Kenya, there are about seven times too few pharmacies per capita than what would be required otherwise. Um, and the uh, it's really a difficult business environment for the pharmacies uh, to really uh, to really thrive. They are all small businesses, and they struggle with things that other small businesses struggle with, like use of data, very fragment, uh, the high fragmentation, um, access to finance, but then also the complications of managing pharmaceutical uh, supply chain. 
and uh, the consequences are really dire. Uh, we see that stockouts of essential medicines can be as high as 50%, uh, even at corner pharmacies. Um, expiry can be 10, 15% a year. Uh, it's enormous inefficiencies. And the consequence is that most pharmacies uh, shrink the number of products they offer and they raise their prices. And the uh, patient really loses out. Um, and as does the market, uh, manufacturers and suppliers trying to get to market and really build the Africa business case uh, struggle because of sort of how difficult it is just simply to reach the patient. Um, so what we've been trying to do from the very beginning is, number one, fix availability, uh, make products available, make high quality products available affordably everywhere. Uh, and uh, in doing so, really transform this business model and the sort of the knock on effect being that there are simply more pharmacies, uh, more places for people to access quality drugs when they need them. So um, our business model, though, uh, in order to accomplish this, software is necessary, but not sufficient. We have, um, we have to do so much more than just provide another piece of, uh, of technology. Um, so we have always been, from the very beginning, a full stack company, a full stack startup, if any of you know that expression. We are both uh, a full stack uh, software company but we are also uh, a registered, licensed uh, pharmaceutical distributor. We decided to jump right into the value chain and, uh, yeah, get right involved in uh, using that technology to help make sure that the, the proceeds and the benefits of that are shared directly with uh, the retailers themselves. So um, we run a program called Shelf Life. Pharmacies can join as a membership. Uh, and as members, they outsource their supply chain to us. And we take over all of the planning, fulfillment, and finance. Um, so there is a lot of technology involved, but there's also a robust uh, agent network. We call them fulfillment partners. And they are out there uh, doing the deliveries, but also doing the stock counts and the stock management. Uh, they're doing the account management. And they are helping augment the uh, very small staff, very small footprint of our clients to make sure that they really benefit from the very best-in-class technology, but also... Uh, are connected back to this broader uh, network of people who are there physically with them, ensuring that those goods are physically available uh, for the client. So, uh, yeah, we exist both as a tech company and as a, a distributor that way. Very uh, tech in touch. Great. Thanks, Michael. Uh, and then Eli, uh, same question to you. Uh, to you. Fantastic. Uh, Matt, thanks for having me here. It's a joy to be here. And Michael Luz, fun to be on a panel with both of you. I'm Eli. I run Apollo Agriculture. Our business is helping farmers make more money. Um, and the way we do that is we pr provide financing and products for um, Africa's small-scale farmer market. You know, I think I'll 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 I'll, I'll save more detail for, for for later in the conversation. But I think just stepping back, I mean. Agriculture is the backbone of most economies across sub-Saharan Africa. 60% of the population, Africa overall has 21% of global farmland, yet I think you know, farmers struggle to access the basic financing and tools that they need to invest in their farm and make more money. And so we obviously didn't discover this problem. Um, this is a, an age-old problem, much like the, the challenges that, that Michael and Luz are working on. But we, we've tried to take a somewhat different approach to addressing it, um, where we said, how do we rebuild with technology the approach to reaching small-scale farmers such that we can meet that half-acre farmer, that one-acre farmer, and see not only an opportunity for us to support them to make more money, but an opportunity to make money ourselves. And in doing so, build something fundamentally more scalable and, 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 and financially sustainable than, than, than what would otherwise be possible. Um, you know, our customer base is heterogeneous. There's no one small-scale farmer, but our average customer is about 50 years old about half men, half women, um, using a feature phone. We've certainly seen smartphone adoption grow, but not that much. Um, so about three out of four Apollo customers don't have a smartphone. And so we're very much building for, you know, what for somebody in San Francisco might feel like the world 10 years ago. Um, but at the same time, we, 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 we have to be able to figure out how do we apply a technology in the right place in an operational process to bring the cost of acquiring, serving, and, and delivering value to a small scale farmer to a level where, where it works for our business. And so I think you know, we're constantly um, puzzling over these sort of tech touch questions, thinking about how do we balance our need for scalability? You know, 
write something in software, deploy it across our entire customer base with our customers' very real desire to be met where they are in terms of their tech literacy. Um, and so I think these are questions we love talking about. And I think you know where we've often found the most value is at that intersection point between technology and operations. You know, a process that can't be solved with peer ops or or peer tech, but rather that when our teams come together um, between technology and operations, we come up with a solution that that is fundamentally better than 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 what either would have come up on their own in a vacuum. So excited to be here! Excited to talk more about these topics and look forward to sharing more about Apollo. Great, yeah. Thanks, thanks everyone for those and for those uh, responses. And um, I'm I'm really intrigued because I think each of you has um, customers that are, uh, as Luz, I think you put it really well, um, that kind of come from different areas of tech savviness and and really being able to accommodate that. I think sometimes the challenge that we notice is the the acquiring a customer that may be less digitally native can be more expensive. It takes more time. And uh, particularly in the venture back startup space, a lot of times we find that those customers get left behind. So, so as you think about this and you, and you really see the balance between all these different customers, um, how have you seen um, your, your approach maintain that balance and ensuring that you are continue to accommodate that less digitally savvy customer, recognizing it might take more time and energy. Um, but but have you thought that have you thought about that internally to to make sure that you are still continuing to reach them in a way that's going to be sustainable for you? Who is that for, Matt? Any All of you, but um, if you Michael, if you, if you have a thought on it, go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Well, this is a this is a huge topic for us. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at uh, so we sell on consignment. It's a form of vendor managed inventory, which is not something we invented. It's something that most really advanced retail operations use across the world. And it solves a lot of problems and allows retailers to, to work really efficiently. Uh, what it requires is it requires the retailer to be fully online, to be recording every sale in a software system, uh, scan based trading. We're getting, we got barcodes and we've got great trade of information across. Uh, none of these things exist in our market. Uh, the, only about half the barcodes, uh, sorry, about half the, the products we get in country even have barcodes on them. Um, POS systems are very, very resource dependent. Um, the skill levels it presumes of, of, of retail attendance is, is totally inappropriate for, for the setting. Um, it was just a non-starter. And if we limited our business only to those who had fully adopted uh, and developed all of those capabilities, it would have put an enormous filter on our market anyway. Uh, so from the very beginning, we had to think differently about how we approach that problem. Um, and, you know, where we ended up was with these fulfillment partners and said it's much easier for us to train and equip uh, a really specialized group of, of agents that we can get to go and serve a broad market, sort of borrowing that from the agent banking model uh, that you see in, in fintech companies other ways. And, um, and that has really carried through the, through the roadmap since, uh, since we started Shelf Life in 2017. Um, everything that we do is sort of... Uh, starting from that lowest common denominator in terms of tech ability and building back up. Uh, and some of that is about segmenting the service. So in, in trying to, as Eli put it, reduce the cost to serve uh, for our clients, uh, if clients who have those skills can benefit from, uh, from certain integrations or certain ways that we can operate more efficiently, then we certainly lean into that and give them the chance. Uh, and that is acting as a way to uh, raise the tide for all the rest of the clients that we serve. Uh, in a way that maybe is is less uh, tech dependent, and so I think for us we've been able to fan out across the market and uh, and develop options on different ways to work together that make it just incredibly accessible. Uh, no matter where you are, we can we can meet you, uh, but it doesn't mean we have to stay at the lowest common denominator. Uh, we can still rise to meet those who are more tech savvy uh, if we build out very intentionally a system that is uh, truly for all of the market. Yeah. Um, and, and complementing with what Michael said on our side in Henry, um, we know that the traditional way of learning online probably won't replace um, in-person learning. That's why we were forced to kind of build a more complex education method, leveraging on our customer base, tech savviness, and different, like that there are different uh, diverse backgrounds. So what we did was deliver an online education which it's completely remote. It's a cohort which is completely remote, got, like accessing everybody in every corner of Latin America, no matter if you live in a big city or if you're in a, in a small town. Um, so 
uh, we build cohort-based education um, where you start uh, start with a group of people who are going through the same experience. And second, when there is like people going through the same experience, um, we understood they could help each other, right? So we are working on collaborative methods and by this we're building a strong community. So how to keep on these people engaged like and mixing different um, customers with different tech savviness approach. So building this, this strong community um, through different methodologies such as, for example, per programming or project based, um, uh, working on projects based um, from real world companies, um, collaborative learning methods as a whole. And all of these are enabled like through tech tools and, and technology who are like, which are implemented in our program. Um, we try to um, replicate a real work experience, um, working with sprints, um, agile methodologies and tech rituals typical from like tech companies, um, such as daily standups, code reviews, retros. So preparing students to kind of be productive from day one and leveling the play field, right? Like even if you come from a super tech background or not. So um, our, 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 like our whole, whole program has like those things, which are from one side, like the technical, um, the technical skills and the soft skills to get to that uh, complete profile uh, to land on a job and be productive and ship and code from day one. Great, that's all really helpful. And I'm curious, you know, as a uh, maybe to um, to your your um, customer base, Eli, given that you probably have some some um, farmers that that are just still um, you know relying on USSD and and that type of communication on a you know like I said on a future phone versus those who might be more tech savvy. Um, have you thought through this and ultimately the the um, I guess the the full breadth of resources or services you provide depending on on a customer's tech savviness? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that we've built from scratch for that feature phone customer. And we also expect to be the first, you know, mobile app for farming that our customers use. But I think that we've definitely prioritized saying, let's broaden the base of customers and make sure that we're meeting the needs of maybe not every customer. Um, but, you know, if we want to talk broadly about opening up the market at scale, and then we say, eh, if you have a smartphone, you know, that's, inconsistent with what we're trying to do. It's inconsistent with the size of the market opportunity. Um, you know, I think ultimately it, it's about matching what needs to happen to the most scalable piece of technology or not technology that can solve a problem. And so maybe this is too kind of intellectualized, but on some level we think about a framework of, you know, sort of most scalable least effective piece of technology all the way up to kind of least scalable highest touch right and so maybe on one side you have an sms and an sms is very scalable right i mean the height of scalability write it send it with software but what we've found is that commuting with our customers is close to worthless um except for as sort of a, a a nudge or a reminder on the flip side you know we could send somebody out to visit our customer you know a highly trained person every time we wanted to have a communication with them and that actually might be delightful for a lot of our customers but we would never have a chance of of building something scalable or profitable and so you know when i think about our different interactions throughout the customer life cycle i think we try and match the right communication modality to the the, the, the task at hand whether that's for example Every customer needs to meet someone from Apollo because someone needs to come and walk the actual GPS boundaries of their field so we can be sure we're looking at the right field from satellite data to actually verify their identity and to gather some information that requires a smartphone. So for that, we've built out an enormous network of agents who partner with Apollo like Lyft or TaskRabbit. Um, it shows up in their app and says, hey, Eli, you know, if you go visit Matt's farm today, you can earn 300 shillings. And then I'm paid upon completion and quality verification. So that requires a smartphone, but we make sure a smartphone goes there. Um, on the flip side, for something like providing advice to customers over the course of the season, we focused really heavily on automated voice, which we found strikes a really nice balance between, you know, the richness of audio-based communication. You know, we can work with radio producers to produce dynamic, engaging content in local language and push it out in a way that a customer just has to answer the phone and they can hear it, um, while still having that sort of cost and scalability profile of an SMS in terms of creating content once and, sh and shipping it out to everybody with, you know, limited marginal cost. Um, and so, you know, I think our approach has generally been to say, 
maybe not lowest common denominator, but to 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 to, to, to really try and broaden the base of customers that we're building for, um, and 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 not cut people out for tech, you know on the basis of technology. Um, but I think we've been able to find ways to do that and deliver really rich, high quality experiences for our customers in a way that also meets our you know fundamental goals around cost and scalability. Great. Yeah. So, so it sounds like all of you have have kind of kept this um, the this lowest na digitally native customer in mind as you've built out things. Um, I'm, I'm curious, and, and um, I know there's a couple of questions that are coming through in the in the chat. Uh, maybe one last one for everybody. Um, we've alluded to this a little bit already, um, but the the pandemic has certainly had its effect on the ability, particularly, to have more in person conversation with with customers. And I'd be curious to hear from all of you, uh, as over the past year, uh, how you've adapted things to make sure you're still accommodating the needs of all of your customers across the digital native scale um, and where you perhaps see things um, that you've learned from that experience that you think are going to kind of keep with you long term. Uh, I know this pandemic is going to be with us for at least another another year, or, um, you know, hopefully hopefully less, but probably about that if we're, if we're being honest. Um, what, what are the things you're carrying with you uh, for, for the long term based on the things you've learned? Any sort of anecdotes you can bring up that, that sort of um, that really bolster this would be really great to hear. Um, Louis, would happy to start with you. Great. Um, so we still don't know how the after COVID world would look like, but what we always think and reflect with the Henry team is that we uh, planted a seed for the future in, in education in Latin America. Um, from my point of view, like being like working with, with the tools and with technology and like no code also tools which actually help us scale and help help us kind of be 24 7 for our customers of our students there um was super important also the the over communication right like um how the program is delivered and like where you can get access to information and like i kind of over communicate um because of being in a remote world was also something which which was super useful for us um from my point of view, during these times, um, we were able to deliver high quality education in many places, um, which was impossible to think just a few years ago, right? Um, so in Henry, we have students like from all cities from Latin America receiving the same quality as a student sitting in Buenos Aires or in Mexico City or in a town in the middle of Colombia, right? Um, so regarding how I think that um, the, the education system will continue like after COVID, um, I think that like the learning method online is, is here to stay. Um, that learning method for reskilling um, based on like cohort based live uh, lectures, online careers with practical work since day one um, will be the best approach, right? Like. Um, understand what the companies are demanding and like teach careers and technologies which which fill these needs. I think that this is something which 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 is going to stay in a in a learning in an online you know and live online and live so like with in, in interaction like in your in your maybe in your couch in your in your in your own house but completely working together with our community, like you are not navigating this alone. Um, this community and this networking is super fundamental and it's something uh, which is super like going to stay also after COVID, like um, which was before COVID also with, with a whole, you know, presence life, which is like networking. But our challenge here is how to take this to the, to the online level. So, you know, um, lots of also uh, technology and non cope no code like software, uh, it's it's helping us. Um, and also, what has you know come to stay is 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 the remote work, right? Right? Like we still don't know how it's gonna work like perfectly end to end. But what we do know is that eighty seven percent of Henry grads work remote, um, and 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 also in a in a remote world, Latam is in a great position to capture. Not only you know local demand, so these twenty-five million job openings I was saying at the beginning, but also demand from demand from U.S. and 
and Europe and all over the world because like specifically in US and Europe, we have like the same time zone English proficiency and, you know, it's cost effective rates for companies um, in those markets. So um, I think that, that, yeah, like we don't, we don't know how it's going to work, but we do know some, you know, key things, uh, which is remote work, um, cohort based live online careers and like this community community and like the support in, in learning by collaboration and with peers. Um, those are things which COVID has accelerated definitely um, in Latin America and are here, you know, to stay. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, Michael, Eli, any, any additional thoughts? You know, I mean, just super briefly, you know, we didn't build a business that we did wanted to be sort of pandemic resilient, right? We set out to build a business that could reach the needs of small scale farmers um, full stop, right? And we wanted to do that in a way that could be scalable and cost efficient driven by technology. But I think it turned out that a lot of the stuff that we did along the way um, in order to do that put us in a really solid position when, you know, when lockdown came into effect in Kenya, when travel restrictions came into place um, and so on. And so, you know, obviously, this has been a you know a challenging last eighteen months, but I think you know farmers are farming, people are eating. You know the opportunity is bigger than ever, and I think if anything, we feel like you know we've been able to operate with quite a lot of continuity, um, and so I feel really really grateful that, <laughs> that, that 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 that's that's been the case. And I you know I yeah I I don't think that you know I don't know what what it looks like to go back to quote normal end quote, but I I you know I don't expect our business to. To, to sort of start suddenly doing a lot of stuff in person again in, 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 beyond what, what we need to to deliver value to our customers. Um, yeah, man, Michael, before you, before you um, offer some thoughts on the question, uh, Mackenzie in the chat had, had an a interesting follow-up that I think is relevant, is hearing um, if there was any specific feedback that you had gotten. So it sounds like fundamentally I'm hearing that, that you've, you've already, you were already in a position where you're able to accommodate customer needs, but were there any particular elements of feedback that helped you sort of adjust your approach to things that, that you saw some things from a strategic perspective, but, but during this past year or so we're, we're notable saying, Oh, like we probably should be emphasizing X a bit more based on some customer feedback loops. Um, Michael, if you want to incorporate that into, into your response to the question, but also lose Neela, if you want to offer a follow-up to what you'd shared before, I think that'd be really helpful. Michael, you're starting? Okay, I start. Um, sure, yeah, so, um, completely, like definitely. We Feedback is, you know, in the heart of every Henry decision. Um, we are taking constantly feedback from, from our customers. And for example, one thing that we are actually, you know, working on right now, um, an example, an anecdote here, is that um, we have a, a full-time career right now, right? Like full stack, full-time career. And this um, in a region also with highest inequality rates obviously make that, you know, people who are actually working, it's impossible for these people to kind of access to this education, right? So we, we launched last year. And since like last year, we have lots of um, prospects or customers talking about like, why don't we have an, an offer? Like, why don't we offer to the market a part-time um, a part-time program, right? Um, and we started recurring feedback um, on how this part-time, you know, program should be. And we started kind of, you know, building together the program. So we co-created um, together with our customers, together with a target, which couldn't, you know, apply to Henry, but was willing to change their lives, you know, working maybe in a call center, to that person wanted maybe to start working uh, in technology or policemen's um, working in, in cybersecurity. So um, so we co-created the program with them. We took, you know, feedback and we make kind of a pivot, a small pivot. You know, it's the same, but part time, but maybe it wasn't in a roadmap. But, you know, um, in the middle of pandemic, people, you know, understood uh, with this whole of, you know, education in technology is the 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 brings a lot of opportunity, a lot of, you know, high paying jobs and so on. So people who were actually working and couldn't, you know, leave their jobs came to us, you know, knocking the door saying, hey, like we would love to have a part time program. And there, well, like we said, OK, like sit in the table and, you know, design it with us. 
Um, and we design a program we're actually about to launch. And, and, and for us, that is a, an example of feedback and how we, you know, pivoted and, and understood their situation in a COVID, you know, um, context where actually they couldn't, you know, move forward um, um, because they needed to work. So, yeah, that is one example in Henry. Great. Uh, Michael? Yeah. Uh, to, to touch on a few of those things, the the pandemic and then the feedback question. Um, so COVID really strengthened the, uh, the business case, I think, for shelf life. I think uh, independent pharmacies saw the need to, uh, uh, there's power in numbers that we should join a large group who can buy together and I can access all the help that I can get through a single place. And, uh, and I can get financing that can really remove the inventory risk and I can get more help running my business. And so we saw a really big surge in demand uh, while we were also responding to updating our own operating model. And certainly, uh, you know, on the sales front, this is a big change in how the business is run. Uh, there's a lot of market education that we still need to do. And we had already planned to invest in uh, more online sort of inbound uh, sales. Uh, sort of enabling more asynchronous uh, remote uh, learning about the system, learning about how it would work with you, uh, and then signing up this way. Um, and then, uh, of course, we already have the Shelf Life app, but uh, we made it far more engaging where we could actually, uh, on a routine basis, be engaging and receiving feedback from clients through the period. So those were all really quite good, but um, I, I think there's two important parts for our, our business uh, in particular here. Um, one is that... In, it's not always for us just about putting more tech in the hands of the retailer or expecting them to use more or the patients to use more. Um, for us, the pandemic has brought on uh, a really <laughs> challenging time in terms of the global uh, health supply chain. There is unbelievable shortages, particularly in Africa. Uh, we all know about the supply chain challenges around the world, but a lot of the pain is being exacted on the continent uh, with shipping lanes being rerouted to to help serve others uh, in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, availability is a real crisis point in a lot of places. And we have needed to put a lot of our tech uh, to invest in smarter and smarter, more and more optimal uh, allocations and what we're able to, uh, to go out and procure and put on our client shelves. And in that way, uh, we hope that the engine that is supposed to be serving these frontline health workers is uh, hopefully getting smarter and smarter. And that is definitely a technology job as much as it is anything else. And, and that is to say that it is, um, it is also about what we're not investing in. Uh, we have been really explicit about not trying to, uh, for lack of a better word, chase trends. Uh, there was a lot of talk about things that are really great in some contexts, like telemedicine or direct to patient, uh, sort of online e-pharmacy, really interesting models that serve different parts of the market in different countries. But um, we are as committed as ever to the fundamentals that uh, good quality products should be available and affordable everywhere in every community. Uh, and that just because some of us around the world are working from home doesn't mean that uh, any of that changes, that you that you suddenly don't need a, uh, your corner pharmacist anymore, that you don't need to be able to pick up something affordably uh, just at the corner when you need it. So uh, I think one of the challenges for us as a tech team is trying to stay focused on those essentials and not jumping to whatever, oh, the world's changing, let's jump to some you know, let's presume that the health system for these countries is radically changing when it's absolutely not. Um, and it's been a really big part of the journey of saying no to things, which I think is important for every, every founder, every technology team, but especially true uh, in this period of real uncertainty. Matt, I'm happy to answer, but also happy to have you continue guiding us. Um, no, go ahead. I think, yeah, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on it. I mean, I was going to say something more just kind of a macro level, but I think it really speaks to this tech touch question, which is when we set out, we said, you know, we're going to acquire customers through channels like radio, roadshows, the type of thing where we could really like connect with a customer remotely and they're going to send an SMS or key in a USSD code and then we're going to give them a call and it's going to be this kind of like, I don't want to say idyllic, but like very remote um fully automated approach. And I think we just have again and again felt this pull from customers towards, I want to learn about your product in person. And initially, that was something we fought really hard. 
um, because I think we felt like, well, are we going to be able to build the level of scalability? Are we going to be able to get the unit economics right if we have that in person? And I think increasingly it's something that we're leaning into and saying, wow, like actually we've built out this unbelievably powerful technology that drives our agent network. And so we can have somebody come visit a farmer for a price that works great within our unit economics. We can build a farmer to farmer referral program, which is our second largest acquisition channel where, you know, you get that same sort of in-person engagement, but not from somebody who's a direct affiliate of Apollo. And so, you know, I think we've felt pre-COVID for sure, and, and, and still throughout COVID, a lot of customer pull towards in-person, you know, saying, sure, I heard about you on the radio, but... You know, I, I didn't know if it was real until I talked to someone, right? I want to not talk to someone who, who I go to church with or who, you know, who, who I speak the same language as or who lives in my community. And so, you know, I think we, we've adjusted and I think it's been, it's been actually fine. Um, but, it, but I think, you know, we actually had to pull back in some ways from and, and, and add more touch in response to what our customers were not just saying, but also demonstrating in terms of things like conversion rates across the funnel for channels with less touch versus channels with more touch. Yeah, I think that's interesting. We see, we see it in a, a couple other um, other portfolio companies in which they've been using TV ads um, quite extensively and the whole idea of, of um, finding finding places that a broader variety of customers are at is a really exceptional way to try to um, broaden the customer base because um, it, it's it's much less relevant to whether or not they're being served like an ad on Google and more of the, the channels that they already exist on. So I, I think that's um, that, that's quite totally. important. For sure. right. Yes, and for marketing. We get great customers from radio. We get great customers directly from agents. Um, but I think we had to say, okay, it's not going to just be the kind of what in Kenya folks call like above the line channels. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Um, I'm I'm realizing we are so we're almost done with time, which is um, which is which is interesting. I, I realized that we could probably talk about this for hours. If we really wanted to. Um, I, there's one other question I wanted to ask you. And I think in particular, given you have this, um, you've got a lot of staff out in the field. So you know, Lewis, for example, you have your educators. Um, you know, Eli, you've got and Michael, you've got agents on the ground working with with farmers and pharmacies. Um, how have you instilled this cus this this um, I think this culture of um, the, the tech touch relationship within your HQ staff. So your, your, you know, your software developers who may never have a touch point with a customer. Um, how have you really brought that into the, into the culture so that it matches what's happening out on the, on the ground? I'll go first. Uh, this is actually why we're named field <laughs> from the very beginning. Um, just because I, we've always thought from, from the outset that this is actually where the, where the magic happens. This is the most important part of the business. And even though we're going to be a tech company, we're going to focus on being in the field. Uh, it's, it's where the customer is, it's where the beneficiary is, it's where the business happens, and uh, it's where we have to be. And for the 10, 12 years I've worked in Africa, in African healthcare settings, I've not found yet a better substitute to being there. Uh, it is the least scalable <laughs> option, perhaps, um, but there's just no substitute for being there. Uh, right now, I'm in Nairobi, and we have uh, two of our product managers and our CTO uh, doing uh, site visits, going out in the field every single day. Um, we have a now that we can travel again. Uh, all of our teams in Nigeria, Kenya, and our small office in Berlin are all rotating, uh, and uh, this is only to build the empathy and the connection to the user and the context that is very clearly for us. Uh, required for building something that's appropriate and uh, and is actually going to return on that investment. And so um, it's not a very good answer, but you got to go. Uh, I think that's the only, the only option for us. Yeah. And um, in Henry, what like Henry as, as you know, Michael's and allies companies is a super mission driven company. So putting the why in the beginning of every meeting we do are like why we're here, right? Like starting with why, like we're here to, you know, um, close the inequality gap in Latin America, right? So putting this why in front of, you know, in every meeting, in, you know, every ritual we do, like from all hands to, you know, retros or like meetups and, and also 
communicating. We have a Slack channel, for example, which is called hashtag boom, which like every since a uh, uh, Henry gets a job, like um, the, the, there's a bot which says like boom, you know, Eli got a job in United States uh, re working remote. So this is the most important like moment for us in the life cycle of the students, right? So this channel, you know, everybody celebrates around like, wow, yes, we can do it. So, you know, a hundred booms to go to reach the thousand booms, for example. So we, so there is a lot of, you know, celebration culture that we promote. We also have like kind of a fail fest. So, you know, come and, you know, tell us which are your failures. You know, we want to understand, we want to learn from that. Um, and and also, you know, putting the, the stories of the, of the customers, of the students in, in the heart of, you know, every decision we make in Henry. Like, um, and also we are like in constant touch with the Henry's because, you know, everything's online. So uh, we have, you know, the community online, we have the, the classes online. So we like everybody, no matter, you know, what role you play in the Henry organization has to attend to graduations, to kind of kickoffs, you know, in order to be in the different, you know, moments of the of the cycle of the Henry life cycle of the student life cycle, in order to, you know, get in touch with the reality and also feel um, the purpose of, you know, why you're here in the in the first place, right? So when we hire in Henry, we we look a lot to this, you know, are you compromised with the mission? Do you, you do you get that we are trying to move the needle? Um, in Latam of education, and also, you know, feel free to, you know, um, say whatever you think and speak up over everything if we should kind of make a pivot in our product or, you know, in order to get to our mission in a better, in a faster, in a greater way of democratizing education. So the constant touch with the, with the, with the people, um, with the students, from our staff, it's, you know, crucial for us. Like we couldn't make it if we don't have, you know, our customers and our students feedback the whole time and iterating um, the way we do things in order to improve. Fantastic. I mean, Matt, I, 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 you know, I, Luce already ended with a boom. Um, so <laughs> not sure I have too much to add other than that it's just so fun to, to be here talking about this topic with, you know, two other folks running such different companies, but where there's so much shared overlap um, in terms of this constant healthy tension between, you know, where where technology has power and where you just got to be there and sit with the customer um, and understand what their needs are. And so it's a joy to be here. Um, and thanks so much for hosting. If anybody has questions, I'm sure there's some way to find me in, in this system. Um, so feel free yeah. to to, re to reach out <laughs> yeah and uh, with the, with that um with that closing note um again so grateful to, to all three of you um it's it's great getting a chance to to hear more about um about about your approach to this this uh this challenge um it's good to see you good to see your faces again um hopefully get a chance to to, to meet in person again sooner rather than later um but yeah so to, to eli's point um katie who's one of our colleagues from axion posted that the, the uh, respective websites of each company if you want to learn more about henry field and apollo um and i think also you can go to the uh the people tab on um on SOCAP and learn more about, about each of us if you want to reach out on LinkedIn or just have any follow-up questions. Um, I, I, I know from experience that all all three of Michael, Luz, and Eli are always responsive and, and happy to share more thoughts on what they're, what they're building. So um, again, very grateful for this conversation. Thank you all for, for attending and uh, looking forward to to learning more and sharing more in the future. And this, this conversation will be recorded. So I think it will be available up on SOCAP website um, in, in uh, short order so you can share with others. Thanks again and have a wonderful rest of the day.